Hello, welcome to the 2020 Learning Trends Beyond the Hype webinar. We have, gosh, almost 200 of you here on the line, and we it looks like we have folks from all over the U.S. Um, thank you for everyone um, who is joined here today. We are um, just glad that you took the time to look at the learning trends that we're seeing, but also to recognize we're in a very different situation than when we were when we collected this data just a couple of months ago. So um, thanks for being here. Our goal is that you'll walk away with inspiration and some new ideas for how what the trends are showing, our current reality, and how you might think about that with the rebound. So with that, we'll move into the introduction. For those of you who don't know us here at Tier 1, we activate strategies through people. So in addition to learning, that activation is a lot of times related to change or transformation, adapting to new mindsets and ways of thinking. So in the spirit of that adaptability, in addition to introducing ourselves, we just wanted to share how we're coping with our and, and adapting to our current reality. And for those of us on this call, it is a virtual um, reality. So I'm Sarah Ernstwinder. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Tier 1. For me, I've been adapting by uh, dusting off my bike to balance out uh, the other habits that have crept into our day. And I have a trail that's uphill from our neighborhood, and it just became symbolic for me that the uphill part of that path before I coast back is the hard part, but that is the part that builds strength. And so that's how I've been thinking about this time. With that, I'd like to turn it over to just these two amazing authors on the Learning Trends Report. They um, have a lot of expertise and are just incredible human beings. So Joe and Sharon are here with me today. Sharon, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Sharon Bowler, and I'm so glad to see you virtually on here this afternoon. Um, I have authored many a trends report. This is my sixth or seventh one. Um, in previous years, they were always role at Bottom Line Performance as president and CEO. But with our acquisition by Tier 1, I get to, for the first time, be authoring under the Tier 1 performance name. And I also have a new partner um, in Joe, who's going to introduce himself in just a second. Um, unsurprising to those who know me, my way of coping with COVID is, as you see below my picture, um, trying to figure out how I replicate the social in a virtual way. So this is an image from a birthday celebration we had a couple weeks ago, and it kind of combines everything I love. It's got my family, it's got games, and um, it's got connection. So that's one way, a big way, that I have been coping in these last few weeks. Joe? All right. Thank you, Sharon. Hi, I'm Joe Janigan, and I'm a senior consultant here at Tier 1. And I've been coping by um, consuming copious amounts of cookies. And I've also been teaching myself how to play the harmonica, uh, much to the chagrin of my wife and son. Uh, but it's a fun thing that kind of keeps me busy and is an exciting little, little break to take during the day is to play a little harmonica. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being with us today. I just was glancing at the introductions. We've got people from all across the country in Brazil. So this is pretty exciting. So uh, we're going to move on. The first thing we're going to do, though, is we're going to turn off our cameras to save a little bit of bandwidth and, uh, and really focus on the presentation. So buy on the camera for now. And the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to move on to uh, talk about some norms for today. Uh, we want you guys to participate as much as possible. So you'll have a chance to see these polls and this, this chat bubble will pop up. So whenever you see that blue chat bubble, that's letting us know or letting you know that we'd like your opinion. Uh, but also feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. As you see something or you want to make a comment or you have a question, please go ahead and ask that. And we will be stopping at the end and leaving a little bit of time for some Q&A. Uh, but right now, get your phone ready. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to use Mentimeter for some polling. So we're going to find out a little bit more about our audience. There you go. So we're going to go to menti.com and type in this code. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take control of the screen for a few. All right. So you're going to go to menti.com. If you've never done this before, you don't need to download an app. There's nothing to authenticate. Just go to menti.com and use the code 4893. 
and that'll get you into our survey and our first question of the day. We've got a couple of responses. So what are the distractions that you're managing? Pets, kids? Boy, all of us are managing technology distractions every day. I actually had to put my phone uh, 15 feet away from me, so it was just not within reach. Uh, deadlines? Um, did anybody pay their taxes yesterday? We had tax day, so I know that's an exciting deadline. We'll wait here and get a few more responses. Oh, boy, it looks like technology is a big one. I've got uh, my five-year-old at home, and they had their dance party earlier. I don't know if anybody has little kids, but uh, we've got some rough weather right now. It's very, very cold. It's like 27 degrees in Cincinnati. And so we've been getting our physical energy out with some dance parties. All right, looking good. It looks like technology is our major distraction right now. That is crazy. I thought it was going to be kids and uh, and maybe just some stress but all right we're going to move on to our next question you can still join us if you're a brand new if you're just joining the uh, the webinar right now again you can go to menti.com and use the code 4893 um what do you do related to l d do you create do you consult do you design do you develop do you lead do you strategize what is it that you do in l d and if you see something up there that you do, if you if you then type that same answer in, it'll show up a larger in our word bubble here. So some strategy, a lot of leaders, which is great. Educator, uh, I myself was a K-12 educator for a long time. I actually was a music teacher before becoming a consultant. All right, a lot of designers, a lot of leaders, strategy. Um, and boy, I'm just transfixed watching this image move here. Very good. So a lot of leaders, a lot of designers, a lot of developers. This is fantastic. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. So what is your goal for today? What are you hoping to get out of this webinar? Do you want to just build some knowledge? Are you looking for something specific? Are you looking for insights to share with others? Maybe you want to see where your company stacks up next to some other companies. So again, if you are just joining us, you can go to menti.com and use the code 4893 and take part in our poll. It looks like we've got some attendees. We got ooh, three people just joined the webinar. That's exciting. Uh, build general knowledge. Good. Well, we're, we're really hoping that by the end of the webinar, we've ticked really all four of these boxes and you are feeling good, like you, you've taken something away from today. Uh, so we're going to transition back now. And uh, Sharon is going to drive the bus for a little while and kind of run down our agenda for the day. Thanks, Joe. So we're going to walk you through some stage setting to kind of get us oriented. And then once we do that stage setting, we're going to dive deeper into the top insights that those of you who have already gotten a copy of the paper uh, or report and have read it, you know we put some top insights in there. We dive deeper on those. And then we're going to kind of wrap things up by talking through a process for how you can manage innovation and uptake in your own organizations. We're going to share the framework we're using at Tier 1, kind of walk you through it, and give you some food for thought as you leave today. So in stage setting, we're going to do two things. I want to talk first about our own behavior as we adapt to innovation. And then I want to share some historical perspective on technology and trends to kind of set the stage for the trends that we talk about today. So let's take a look first at the innovation curve that is probably somewhat familiar to most of you. But before I do that, um, I want to put that innovation curve in the context of the thing that's on everyone's mind, which is COVID-19. We aren't ignoring COVID. It is not in the report. It is very much with us in today's presentations. We want to keep it in perspective as we talk about trends with you. It has definitely massively created, adjusted, or redefined short-term problems that businesses are seeing. And that in turn has an impact on the solution space that L&D is operating within. COVID is also generating conversations about the long-term. Um, in terms of its ability to accelerate certain trends that may have been early stage but might move faster, such as robotics and machine learning and artificial intelligence, because we have to absorb the possibility that social distancing is not going to be something that just persists for weeks, but in reality, it may persist for 12 to 24 months. 
So we're gonna bring up COVID several times. Um, as we share thoughts in emerging data, we're gonna invite you to share your ideas with us. One obvious and immediate issue is that COVID has gotten us all exploring ways that we can use technology to enable us to replicate things that we were doing face-to-face -face or achieving via face-to-face -face interactions. So now let's take a look at this innovation adoption curve. Um, I thought because of COVID, it would be really helpful to orient ourselves along this curve. Where we were before COVID pushed us to changes that we otherwise might not have made and where we might go and where our natural tendencies are when we're not pushed by a crisis. Um, most importantly, I wanted to reference this curve to get us all thinking about when we're the one who needs to drive a change or an innovation, how do we consider where others might be along that curve and what means and mechanisms might be most effective in helping persuade them to adopt an innovation. So let's take a look at this and I'll very quickly go through and show you the definitions of different areas on this curve. So the percentages kind of show you where people fall along a curve and this is a well-established curve. This is the Rogers curve that was created way back in the 1960s. It started out actually in the field of agriculture but it's been embraced more generally as a good reflection of how the population generally lands. So on the far left of the curve, you have two and a half percent of the population who tend to be the true innovators in our society. They are the fringe and they're the people that futurists like to pay attention to when trying to figure out what the next trend might be. They're the biggest risk takers. They're the idea developers. They need partnership with early adopters to actually get their trend to get traction. So that takes us to the early adopters who are again, a very small minority of us, 13 and a half percent. Those folks are the opinion leaders and the trendsetters. They're the ones we listen to. They embrace change and they don't need a lot of convincing. Um, they more need to know how to than to be convinced to do it. The early majority are those of us who are more conventional. They adopt things earlier than average, but they want proof. They value success stories and evidence of success. The good news is they don't need tons of success stories. They need one or two to get them intrigued and interested and willing to try it. Then we go over to the down slope of the curve and we get the skeptics. The skeptics are those of us who want to see that lots of other people have already done it and they've done it successfully. Um, the percentage of people who have adopted matters to them. So they wanna see a nice big group of people who are already doing something. And finally, on the tail end of that curve, you have the laggards. And the laggards are the ones who only adopt out of fear or overwhelming evidence. And it's kind of interesting if you think about this whole COVID crisis and where people fell on the curve with that. Um, in adopting social distancing practices, in choosing to start wearing masks, in making decisions about their behavior. You had people very early on that curve and you had people on the lagging end of the curve. And I'm talking to my husband today about behavior in the grocery store. He commented over the last four weeks on watching the change in behavior as people got into that grocery store. And you can kind of guess that the laggards are the ones who finally did it out of a feeling of fear. So it's interesting to know. It's also good to know that how you show up in your work life may be different than how you show up in your personal life. So um, I want you to think about where you are in your work life and let's just kind of take a poll and tell us where you are on the innovation adoption curve. So just select one of those. Do you think of yourself as the innovator, the two and a half percent? The early adopter who's 13 and a half percent, you're setting trends and being an opinion leader. An early majority, you're more conventional, but you're adopt earlier than usual um, or a little bit later. So I'm seeing a lot of folks and I'm getting a little bit of a chuckle out of it because um, apparently the innovators are dramatically going against the curve as we have a lot of them. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close this and share it out so you can see it. And you can see that um, 
we've kind of flipped that curve a little bit and saying there's very few laggards, very few late majority people, and we have an awful lot of innovators and early adopters here with a good percentage of early majority as well. So now I'm going to say that's how you would say you are. What about your company? If you think about your company's leadership, where are they on this curve? So are they the ones who are on the fringe developing ideas and they need partnership? Are they an early adopter, early majority, or laggards? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. I've gotten a good percentage and I'm chuckling again because amazingly, even though we are innovators and early adopters, apparently our companies are a lot of late majority and laggards. So um, make of that what you will. Let's move on and be mindful of thinking about those strategies that are going to help you persuade that innovation is necessary. So let me share, hide that and move us on. So I made a quote in the trends report about how L&D and its trends is a lot like watching yourself age. Um, year to year, from a young adulthood to old age, you don't see dramatic changes or shifts in the landscape. Uh, so the the year to year changes aren't drastic, but boy, when you look a decade or more, you start to see some big changes. And I actually included a couple of inventions over here on the left to to prick that thought. So the phone was invented in 1876, which is a very long time ago. Um, if we think about history and what's happened in the last 150 plus years. We didn't get to the rotary dial until the 1920s. We were still using the rotary dial in the 1950s. We went cordless in the 1980s, and actually smartphones started to emerge in the 1990s. So that will be a question for yourself if you consider yourself an innovator or an early adopter is to consider your own adoption of smartphone technology. The iPhone didn't come out until 2007. So if you bought the iPhone, you're actually not an early adopter or an innovator. You're more um, an early majority. And that took that phone to finally transform that technology and make it something that caused incredible change. For those of you interested in VR, it was actually invented in the 1950s um, with the Sensorama. And it was only a few years ago when we got the headsets, and more particularly in the last two years when we got the cordless untethered headsets that it started to take off. So we may think that we're adopting a technology early only to discover, oh my gosh, it's actually been in the landscape for a really long time. So I want you to use the chat and tell me, I've got three technologies that we're hearing talked about or solutions in the L&D space. When did you first notice those in your landscape? So you can just put, chat bot in a date or two years ago or whatever and for the ones that uh you heard about let us know 2015 for chat bots i'm seeing that one i'm hearing five years ago for about all of them which would be about 2015 again so let's take a look and see when 2018 and 2019 so just a couple of years ago Augmented Reality 2018, let's take a peek. So chatbots were actually invented in 1966 um, by MIT Labs. Augmented Reality jumped out in 1968. It actually kind of started to emerge onto the landscape that we might see way back in 2009 when the first books incorporated augmented reality where you could kind of target something on the book and something would emerge from a children's book to kind of come to life. And then XAPI got on the landscape back in 2011. So kind of a long time ago, you guys, and yet we tend to think of them as more recent developments. So this brings us into the conversation of solution spaces versus problem spaces. And in L&D, we can get overly focused on the solution spaces. We get caught up in the shiny and the intriguing, 
whereas the business leaders are focused on the problem spaces, some of which I have listed there. The goal is to find that sweet spot. So we're, we exist to activate strategy. We exist to kind of bring to life and come up with solutions to problems or challenges that businesses have. So Joe and I had some fun kind of mapping out the current solution space, um, looking through the literature and the landscape, and then mapping things across this continuum, if you will. So you have some things that are hyped or hot, but you're not seeing them implemented in very many places. We have what we call a wannabe, which is where we put XAPI. It's just having a tough time getting traction. We have a few things that are in right now and people are doing them. They're getting excited by them. And then we have some entrenched things and hanging on things that are there, but we may not always have a compelling business reason for them to be there. So I would love to know from you in the questions or chat, think about the pandemic and COVID. What suddenly changed on this chart? Is there anything that you would add? Okay, yeah, I'm hearing someone say videos have done a dramatic uptick, e-learning, virtual delivery, virtual training. You guys have nailed it. So when we think about it, we have definitely added hyped or hot virtual instructor-led training, which was pretty much suddenly everybody's asking about it. And more importantly, virtual collaboration tools. Um, we're also suddenly finding that we have a problem in that we don't have a lot of people with virtual facilitation skills. And we need to emphasize and build that capacity very, very quickly. So with that said, Joe's going to take it over from here and start talking about top insights. Great. Thanks, Jaren. Um, by the way, I'm a, what is it, early majority. That's me. That's where I fall, I think, on here is early majority. Um, so instead of reviewing the data and just getting some real-time feedback from everybody, what we decided to do was share these six big insights that surfaced uh, and dive into what that tells us about the state of the industry. All right, insight number one, time. Time is an issue. Uh, we're, there just isn't enough of it and people are feeling really, really stretched. So we see that in our survey results. As you can see here, the, our largest change here is in time. So we asked, what challenges are your learners facing? And the number one is time. And that squeeze is getting worse. Uh, it grew about 25 points this year. And this is something that affects both L&D professionals and learners. Um, as business needs change, you know, L&D works to meet that demand for new content. And learners are being asked to upskill and adapt. Uh, so they're constantly going to new ways of working, new software, new platforms. We're gonna go ahead here, Sharon. Um, time is precious. We're seeing that reflected in a couple other responses. So we asked, what are you excited about in 2020? And you'll see these orange boxes here, the far left micro learning, and we've got video and mobile, and we've got behavioral nudge campaigns that drip out content as you need it, and podcasts. Uh, these are all ways that could conceivably save time. You could do these things on your own. Micro learning, just a quick burst of information. A video might be a tutorial that helps you, or the podcast is something you listen to during your commute. Um, I do wanna make a note here, those with a sharp eye might notice that the dark blue graph lines that's the 2020 results are much higher than all the previous year's results. That's because we changed our survey and allowed respondents to choose as many options as they were excited about. Where in the past, they could only choose one or two. So that bumped our results up, but the ratio still remains the same. But we're gonna move on and talk about micro learning. As a response to a lack of time, uh, micro learning makes a lot of sense, right? This is something we already do in our own time. Um, your sink gets clogged and what do you do? You go to YouTube, and you try to find that solution. You search, if you're me, you look for the one that's been viewed the most, but that's the shortest. So you try to find the best solution for your current need. Um, but the question is, is how can L&D scale this habit? Uh, can they create resources that fit into this workflow and meet the needs of the learner? The challenge is this is a huge departure from an LMS and a traditional push model, right? Will our users adopt the solution? Uh, this is a big change from the way things have, have worked in the past. But let's go ahead and dive a little deeper into micro learning. So here's a couple questions you might want to ask yourself before you dive into micro learning as your solution. It's not suited for everything. A few of the key questions here on the next slide, number four and number seven, I think, are the most important. Number four is, is this content digestible in small bites? Is this something um, that can be chunked? Is it a process or is it more abstract and need a little additional content? Or number seven down there, 
is there a way that we can make this content findable, right? I don't think this is gonna blow anybody's minds, but LMSs can be really clunky and really awkward. Um, what can we do to make this content findable? Well, let's look at a solution that we've worked on over the past year and a bit. This is actually a really simple idea. It's a self-contained library on uh, an organizational device. So this is for a global airline, global air carrier brand. They can push out the content to all the devices at once. All we did was we created an interactive PDF that looks and feels like an app. Okay, you open it on your home screen just like an app. It's got a great index. Uh, and what it's providing is simple step-by-step -step job aids. Uh, you can swipe or touch, you know, there's back and forward buttons and there's the little breadcrumbs. So there's the little, uh, the, the red dots where it says below before you register, that's indicating you're on slide two of two. On the next one under operation, those three dots are indicating you're on slide one of one. Um, but let's look at these images for a second. Before you register, this is for uh, anybody who works really in the airline industry who's going to be at an airport. Every airport has a different way to check in and get through security. And what this is is a quick reference for where are you and what is the process for checking in. So it's just a step-by-step -step guide. Um, the one on the right there is how to operate a jump seat. So each aircraft has a different jump seat. What the jump seat is, it's that foldable chair that many of you may have seen that the flight attendant will sit on during um, uh, takeoff or arrival. And each aircraft has a slightly different version. So that's a step-by-step -step way to work them through uh, how to use that jump seat. So again, it's really simple, it's interactive, it's just in time, it's on-demand learning. All right, Sharon, we're ready to move on here. We're talking insights number two and three. So the headline here is insight number two, which is many of these LD challenges are tying right into broader organizational problem spaces. The subheading is one of those big challenges, the demand for skill is increasing. Uh, we're having boomers exit the workforce and Generation Z entering, and that's leaving a big skill gap. So let's take a look at how that's reflected in the survey. So we asked, what are the organizational problems that create your highest demand for L&D? So we've got business transformation, business growth, new systems and technologies, onboarding. What are all of these things? They're all change. Uh, they're all growth. So we're real curious, uh, use the question in the chat and tell us uh, what problem spaces are you currently supporting in your organization? So what are the recent challenges your organizational or leadership has asked you to support? Um, I have a feeling before we even get to the questions that we're going to be talking about school. Yep. Yeah, change, yep. transformation. Seen mm -hmm. a lot, Joe. Yeah, time management, finances to help with that adoption, COVID, you know, onboarding. Yeah, so, so you guys are getting it, right? Let's move on to the next slide here. So we understand the challenges. Now let's talk about what are the keys to success? Well, one of them is alignment. So we know as L&D folks that the solution has to be aligned to a specific problem. In the same way, L&D must be aligned with leadership. So we asked about this relationship and we asked about this alignment and the results are really solid. Uh, go ahead and, and get our animation going here. 66% uh, are very, very strong when they talk about their business relationship. And we asked about alignment. 50% of the respondents said they're very aligned with 40% saying they're somewhat aligned. These are great numbers. But when we ask about your success, only 15% labeled that success extremely successful. So what's missing? Well, let's move on here. We know from experience and the data tells us the exact same thing, which is leadership is the key. Right? What's missing is leadership support, buy-in, and good change management. Uh, a great learning initiative rolled out without support is gonna fall flat. Um, something that's really interesting to me is that this was an open-ended question. We did not provide these choices. And you'll see a, a big majority of respondents had something to the effect of acceptance by the organization, ownership by management, leadership, support and sustain. So it's just that was our number one with a bullet here. And I also want to point out that there's a 50% drop before we start to talk about content. Number two is application and retention, which is related to content, but also related to support. Uh, number four is correctly designed programs. So what this is telling me is that content needs to be good enough, but more importantly, it needs to be supported and sustained. So let's dive in a little bit more to support and sustain. Uh, change happens on a continuum. It's not a single event. It's a journey, and, and too often the focus is just on the stage two, this learn part. How do we acquire this? Uh, but what we have found is stages three and four on the map, they're about leadership, taking and owning and reinforcing what's covered in these programs and sustaining that over time. 
Um, I'm a former uh, K-12 teacher, and for me, number five there, that reflect and explore, that metacognition piece is huge. When we can take a, a minute to learn what we've learned or learn from what we've learned, that's when it really starts to stick. Uh, we're going to talk about a case study here. So recently, we designed a training program for a major manufacturer. And uh, you'll notice there, this is a six-month program, and it actually starts before their first day of work. So they have pre-boarding that goes on, and that sustains all the way through for six months. Now, what I want to do is relate this back to the map we were just talking about. You'll see in the practice and perform stage here, if we animate it, that little orange box will pop up. Um, the practice and performance stage of this journey is as much about the content as it is about building and sustaining relationships. So we were able to embed a regular cadence of conversations, observations, and assessments with leadership. Um, so it's a part of the training, and that helps sustain it and make it meaningful. Uh, and I think we're ready, Sharon, to hand off to you for insight number four. Awesome. So I'm going to be talking about augmented reality and virtual reality here. Um, interest is skyrocketing, even though we now know that AR or VR first came onto the scene in the 1950s. It's suddenly something that people are paying attention to. So when asked what trends or delivery methods people were most excited about in 2020, you can see that there are three areas. Um, VR and AR was one, and then there were a couple of others that uh, podcasts, behavioral nudge campaigns, et cetera. We lasered in on AR and VR because we're very intrigued. The value of them and the use case has been very niche so far, and the cost is very high. Scale and stakes matter when you use it. So uh, Verizon has a well-known case study about how they use virtual reality to train employees in hostage situations and armed robberies. Well, Verizon has 1,600 stores across the United States, and they have 135,000 employees worldwide. So them rolling out a virtual reality solution, the cost of that can be spread very widely, leading to a pretty good ROI for them and a high impact situation. So the stakes are really high here. Um, there's risk of loss of life if this is not handled well, there's, there's trauma, et cetera. So it makes a compelling use case for virtual reality. Walmart has gone in big on virtual reality. They're probably one of the best known use cases of it so far because they've invested heavily across all their stores in the country. They've implemented it and sent headsets to every store so all associates can be onboarded using it as part of their live training experience. March 20th of this year, The Verge reported that in response to coronavirus, Walmart was trying to hire 150,000 new associates. So you can imagine again the scale here that they're able to employ and how virtual reality pays off. But it still remains very niche because of its relative expense to produce. However, MIT Technology Review just yesterday released this article based on a study that is showing, you know what? We could be facing some degree of social distancing all the way through 2021 to 2022. That brings the intrigue into virtual spaces. Microsoft's Altspace VR enables you to hold an entire conference in a virtual space. Everybody can come together in this immersive space. You're doing it real time. You're having your discussion real time. And it's kind of shutting out the rest of the world while you're in that space, getting you as close to immersed as you can be. So that brings a question mark on how COVID-19 might change that space. Insights five and six, efforts to enhance the learning experience have to benefit not just the business, but also the learner. And we have to look at what we call the big four, instructor-led training, virtual instructor-led training, e-learning and video, and ask if that legacy is going to persist. So let's talk about learning experience first. Um, a key principle of design thinking is to not just focus on the business case, but to focus actually on the learner and the customer first and consider their wants and needs and not just the business needs. It's about finding that sweet spot where needs are being met for both the business and the user, which in our case is the learner, and they're also within the realm of the technology or environmental constraints you have. 
So there's a mismatch between what L&D has most often been offering and the learning experience that people indicate they most value. So you can see we've got four years of data here on asking what method of delivery will you use in 2020. And you'll see that face-to-face -face ILT is still the most dominant method, followed closely by traditional e-learning, what I call the click next, instructional videos, and virtual ILT. And yet, when Jane Hart does her survey, which she's done since 2010 of the modern learner, she gets a different answer. She says that learners or learners themselves say that they most want search. Um, they want knowledge sharing and web search capabilities far more than they value or benefit from e-learning conferences or classroom training. So it's something for us to think about in terms of what kind of experience we're delivering. The good news is that for sure, interest in design thinking and learning experience design is dramatically increasing. So people are kind of sensing that all is not well in our environment and there is an opportunity to do and think differently about how we design the experience, which goes to what Joe was saying about the learning journey and the fact that we have to attend to the whole journey. We cannot just focus on step three, which is learn, and having events for people to practice. So out of curiosity, I'd love to know where learners are in your process. So if we think, and this is the learner experience, learning experience framework um, design that we're pushing out in the design thinking book that we have coming out shortly. Um, Laura Fletcher and I are actually the authors of that. We're excited and I know Laura is on this, this webcast today. We've taken the design thinking process, which starts with get perspective, goes to refining and defining a problem, ideating, prototyping, iterating, and then implementing. And we kind of map that to how you can do that in L&D. We don't get to typically define the problem. We usually get a problem presented to us, and our job is to get perspective and work to refine that problem. We get perspective from learners. We need to understand it from their point of view. Ideally, we would involve them in ideating on the possible solutions and in crafting prototypes and testing those prototypes, then we would iterate on that, test and refine. Too often in traditional models, the learner comes into play oftentimes at the pilot stage where you've pretty much got the solution done and you're kind of looking um, to get a uh, holy water splashed on it or maybe make a few changes. And I'm excited in the chat to see some people saying that they're pulling their learners in to help ideate and they're pulling their learners in to help prototype, which is awesome. There's a lot of value in that. And in some instances to, to understand the problem. The goal, the sweet spot, is getting them involved throughout the process instead of at just one specific point in the process. So here's the difference learners can make. This is a story at one of our clients is Next Stage, and they produce home hemodialysis machine so people can do dialysis at home and this is a patient undergoing dialysis in her home and you can kind of see the setup and how much space she has and where the tubes are so when the customer came to us and wanted to reimagine the training they knew they had to get rid of a laptop computer and they knew that binders weren't going to work but they really wanted to go with the tablet and you can kind of see from her setup that a tablet could be very awkward by pulling learners in early and including them in the ideation process and the testing process, it became very clear and they were very vehement that no, they wanted it on a phone. And that is a difference maker because it can be the difference between success or failure in your model. So let's pull all this together. We've gone through six insights. Let's look at a couple of case studies to show how these insights can translate. And this is a gamified micro learning solution that we have just evolved a proof of concept for, for a wonderful local client called Dormacaba. And it kind of hits on four of the six trends, the time available to learn and to create, L&D challenges tying into broader organizational problem spaces, the need to expand and upskill, and the fact that the experience has to benefit both the learner and the business. So, what did we create? We built a proof of concept going to the idea of using learning experience design and not blowing out a whole solution before we tested to see um, that could help resolve a problem they had with trying to pull together three entities into one 
upscaling a workforce, making space for Gen Z as the boomer generation is leaving, and providing a fast means of not only creating content, but delivering that content out to learners. So this gamified solution that was designed as mobile first gave them three topics. Each topic had mini games that they could play and a study guide. And it was very cool because we involved learners in the testing was to see how they played and then studied if they couldn't succeed at the game, which is sort of a flip. Um, 300 players have played so far across four weeks of time. And so far that bounce rate has been under a percent, which is amazing. And the average play time has been about 10 minutes per instance. It's been a great example of applying all of those insights together to form a solution that can really work for the organization and for the learner. This next example is around augmented reality. We actually labeled it mixed reality. This connects not only to AR and VR, but also again to learning experience, finding one that benefits the learner and the business. So the client situation was they had a great drug that solved a very complicated disease. Um, it benefited patients when other therapies would not but they had a tough time selling it because patients had to fail first on that therapy before they could go to it, making it harder for physicians to prescribe it. That was demotivating to sales reps because it was harder to get talk time with the physician about it. Um, the client wanted to try an augmented reality solution, so we had to kind of combine the value with the challenges, and we ended up creating a museum-style experience that blended the web application augmented reality and multimedia. The goal wasn't to train these people, it was to build empathy. Get the rep to empathize with patients so that they could be more motivated to talk to the physician about a therapy that had the potential to be much more effective in treating a disease state. So learners went through this museum-like experience using an app and augmented reality. They started a patient journey with that patient's perspective in mind um, selecting a patient and then going through the exhibit using the AR to trigger multimedia experiences where they got to hear patients tell their stories and see videos of their life at work, at home, and in the physician's office. After they exited, then they got prompted to kind of rate their empathy. So they did it before and after to see what changed for them. And to maximize value, as I talked about trying to get things to scale and get the ROI, everything could be repurposed to function as part of onboarding for new reps. It didn't have to be set up as a museum style exhibit. So Joe, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to kind of talk about how we evaluate and experiment with what's coming. And actually, I guess I have to start this, don't I? Um, almost, I start, you. almost you, Joe, not quite yet. Um, this is the model that we're using and exploring. It's an innovation framework. And the, the most important thing, and the thing I love most about this framework is the fact that needs are on top and solution is on the bottom. And we're trying to find that sweet spot in the middle where solutions can meet needs. Um, so that starts by the sensing the signals and the trends and prioritizing. So I would love to know where do you look when you're trying to identify new trends? Um, all right. It could be webinars like this. It could be publications that you love. It could be people that you talk to. So I see one person saying they, they look to the talent data. Um, they look to thought leaders. YouTube, that's an YouTube. interesting one. Vendor well, partners, tech shows, LinkedIn, Horizon Report. Yeah, there's a lot of them. But what's important is that you do it, that you do execute a sense and respond strategy. For me, I'm scanning all the time, and I have a few go-to places. I love Amy Webb and her Future Today Institute and her annual Tech Trends report. Um, I love MIT Tech Review. I have thought leaders, and I will also tell you guys, it's helpful to talk to salespeople because they stay attuned to what their clients need. So, Jim, now I'll turn it over to you to talk about the insight sprints. All right. So we did... Uh kind of a loose overview of this insight sprint. Uh, you know, we've got the needs on top, solution on the bottom, and this is an, a, a way or like a, a, it's really set up as a two week agile sprint to look at trends and identify a need and a potential solution. Uh, then which is followed by another quick sprint to explore and incubate ideas. The whole process here, the whole point of this though, is that 
quickly iterate, test, and either continue moving forward with an idea or discard the idea. Um, and I'm going to try to see if it'll let me. You know what, Sharon, we're going to have you drive the boat on this one too. Okay. All right. So we have sensed a problem. It's a pretty obvious problem, right? COVID-19, shelter in place. Uh, but we also, from talking to people that we work with and our clients and customers, we're finding out that there is a need. We need to rapidly hire and onboard folks. Now, some industries have been hit really hard. The other end has been lots of furloughs and layoffs, but healthcare, grocery, and related supply chains um, are really desperate to hire people. They're actually hiring people on the spot and putting them to work that day. So what's the potential solution? Was it VR? Is it micro learning? Is it a two day ILT? Is it virtual ILT? Is it e-learning? Is it videos? Well, to figure this out, we're gonna go ahead and use this Insight Sprint. So what we wanna do is we wanna answer three questions. What is the trend in context? What's your perspective on this trend? And how can your organization help users or customers related to this trend? Well, for us in this circumstance, what it looks like is the trend is the challenges presented by the pandemic. Uh, what's your perspective? Well, we have best practices, tools, resources, and expertise that we can share. How can your uh, organization help? Well, we can create accelerated onboarding supports for the healthcare, grocery, and supply chain industries. So what happens next? We've, we've sensed, we've done an insight sprint, and now we're going to explore, incubate, and accelerate. So what does that mean? Explore. We're going to select an idea. There's going to be some rapid ideation and prototyping. And what that looks like here on the animation is it's going to be we're going to gather and refine our best practices uh, for this accelerated onboarding and then we're going to incubate that idea so we're going to gather insights innovators and leadership are going to gather feedback and input uh, internally and from customers uh, and then we're going to accelerate this we're actually going to create a prototype we're going to develop a solution and test that with the client um, so let's talk about what these examples might look like on the next slide here you're going to see our uh, a solution that we de developed and that we're testing with clients. Uh, on the left side, this is two sides of a, what we're calling a one pager. On the left side, the bottom half of the page there are what I would call more like philosophical ways to deal with rapid onboarding or accelerated onboarding. Um, I'm going to point out a few of them. The first one there is prioritize urgent HR tasks. What can we do to cut the red tape so we can get the employee here and working as fast as possible? Uh, and I guess I think it's the third one there, it's kind of on the center of that page, uh, is how can we optimize their current skill set and experience? What jobs or what roles or what activities can they take part in in this new job that's related to their old job? So how can we get them to work right away with minimal training? The second page, which is the backside of this document, is smaller, more targeted ideas. Uh, the second one there is connecting employees or new employees with experienced employees and leaning on that informal training. Oftentimes those employees who have the breadth and depth of the organization, that's where some of the best training takes place in that informal atmosphere where you're not afraid to make mistakes and people can give you tips on the job. And then the bottom one where you see that QR code, this is one of my favorites, we're calling this roadside assistance. It's just on-demand job aids. So put yourself in the shoes of maybe a nurse who left the industry and uh, is doing something else, maybe they're in hospitality and now they don't have a job in hospitality and they're going back to nursing. And now they're in a unit that has all these COVID uh, ventilators and they don't know how to learn, or they don't have the time to learn how to use eight or 10 ventilators, but what they do have is a phone in their pocket. And they can take that phone, they can scan that QR, and they can be directed to like a low fidelity video that maybe somebody else made with a phone, that here are the three things you need to know now about operating this uh, ventilator. So we're just trying to share our expertise and put it together in a simple way that can be digested. Moving and you know, on. You know yep, Joe, I would, I would point out that um, if you think about QR codes and the radio frequency tags that we mentioned on the bottom of that, those are not the most innovative technologies, but they no. are technologies that enable us to hit a very hot issue in the moment. So it's important that we not always have our minds going to what's the newest thing I can use. It's about what's the best solution I can use. Yeah, what's going to be most effective? And I think but the funny thing with the QR codes, um, yeah, I remember seeing those 10, 15 years ago, and nothing really happened. And all of a sudden, they're coming back. You're starting to see them everywhere. Um, so scaling. Scaling is tricky. Um, in normal times, um, we're talking about how to scale internally. Is the organization ready? Are they available? What can we do to help them scale? Well, in this pandemic times, we need to scale now. 
And this is something that's, that's happening really in progress. So what that looks like for us is we're sharing the information with anybody who needs it. We're trying to figure out who we have internally that can support this effort now. Um, the needs, uh, this needs to happen now, right? Six weeks from now is too late. This pandemic, we're in it. Um, so this is a quick overview of this model. Sensing an insight sprint to either discover the need or discover a solution. Another sprint to explore, incubate, and accelerate that solution. Um, this model can morph and adapt for your organization's needs. And really, this is just a framework for how you might approach innovation. Um, I think we're getting ready to move on to our conclusion here and hand off to Sarah. Are you with us, Sarah? Karen and Joe, thank you so much for sharing those insights. I always love seeing how the insights play out into the solution. So um, we do have time for just a couple of questions. And I will go ahead. Um, it looks like you know, Sharon, there is some interest in hearing again about the trends and insights, the folks that you follow for that. So I'll turn it over to you. And if anyone else has other questions, go ahead and submit those now. Um, I follow a lot of people, <laughs> I will tell you. Um, one that I think is very worthy of anyone following is Amy Webb, A-M-Y-W-E-B-B. -B. Um, and the Future Today Institute. I think she has the most wide ranging information and reports that spans across all industries. So I think it's important not to be focused exclusively on L&D. And so I try to scan the whole industry in the problem space, not just L&D. So I would go there. I think the eLearning Guild does a tremendous job. Um, David Kelly in particular at pushing out emerging tech for L&D. I love to read MIT Technology Review, which is a daily digest. And I also read and follow a list called The Road to VR. So those are four. I could give you more, and I'm happy to do that offline. Thank you. One other question is, when uh, going back to the VR, um, when we think about that, do you have any thoughts on how that might look with after COVID-19, will it change folks' minds about using VR headsets? Will they trust the cleanliness? Any insights on how we might deal, deal with that? Um, I can share a little bit of how that works. Uh, again, coming from education, we'd have one headset and you'd have to use it in 15 different classrooms. Um, they, they actually come with little kits, these little cleaning kits that are pretty easy to do and pretty easy to use. And they also have uh, like, the device itself, the phone, the actual VR device is the expensive part. The headset is the cheap part. So I'm sure there's a, certainly a way that you could approach that. But that, I mean, that is a very real challenge. It is. And I, I will be frank, until COVID, I wasn't so hot on VR because I think it has challenges. Um, one issue that is unresolved with it is the latency problem with it. Um, it causes motion sickness in probably 20 to 25 percent of the people who are in it which means that you have to limit the amount of time you can spend in it. So most people can stand to be in it for 10 to 15 minutes, um, but that limits some of its use cases. I'm more interested in these live VR spaces where they can go for conferencing, which would mean that you're not all sharing headsets, but you might have your own headset in your home or your own environment. And you have to worry less about the cleanliness of that headset because it's not going to be traded with others. Thank you. We are just about at the top of the hour. So again, thanks Sharon and Joe for sharing your insights. Thank you to everyone out there who joined us today. We um, are happy to connect with you. So at Tier 1, we, as I mentioned earlier, we partner to activate strategies through people. And as we navigate through this pandemic and look toward the rebound, we're looking at a lot of issues that we haven't dealt with before. So. If you have any questions, reach out to us. We're happy to talk through um, performance challenges, activation spaces that you're looking at, or if you just want to talk about anything covered in today's webinar. So our contact information is here on the screen. We'll also be following up with an email that includes the recording and link to the Learning Trends Report. So uh, we see that a couple of people weren't able to join the audio. Again, we'll include the recording, so share that with your coworkers. And once again, thank you so much for joining us here today. This concludes today's webinar.